start it off. All right. Once again, thank each and every one of you for joining in on the conversation. My name is Sia Moila. Um, I am the founder of Instrument of God Ministries, LLC, um, where I provide individuals, families, and organizations with trauma recovery support. Um, so we are having this discussion because it was important for us to highlight things that are going in, um, going on in Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone is a country that my family is from, where I am from, where I'm, um, my roots are. Um, so we came across Tyson's documentary, um, and a lot of people were just having a conversation. Um, I believe it was me and Bobby, one of the members of the Sierra Leone group, and it just really impacted us. And so... We kind of searched out where he was, found him, and asked him to do an interview. Um, Ish came on along, um, and definitely um, we just thought that it would be a good interview um, to give to our audience and us as a whole as Sierra Leoneans. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Ish so he can introduce himself. All right, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are in the world. Um, my name is Ishmael. I am one of the founding admins of the Sierra Leone Club on Clubhouse. Um, what we're here to do today is we're here to have a dialogue. We're here to um, get deep into this growing issue that is happening in our country of Sierra Leone. Um, and speaking with Mr. Tyson today, we get to ask him a couple of questions, uh, get some feedback on his personal views on what's going on as far as the sex work is concerned in Sierra Leone. And as far as uh, human trafficking is con concerned as well. If you guys can give me one brief moment, I'm going to go turn the audio upstairs off because it's echoing. Give me one moment, please. Okay. Tyson, if you just want to why Ishmael's doing that, go ahead and maybe um, introduce yourself to the group so they can know a little bit about who you are, what you do. Um, share anything that is on your heart this morning. All right, I'm back. I'm gonna have it. my phone just down here. Okay, you're on, you're on mute, Tyson. <laughs> okay, I'm back now. So I'm Tyson Conte and I'm a filmmaker. Um, well, I've been doing filmmaking for maybe 15 years and, you know, starting from a very small and um, a very small way. And, you know, so, I mean, I started off just thinking like, um, this is my passion, this is what I want to do, this is what I like to do, I mean, and then I started bringing, you know, people together and, you know, started doing drama on stage and all these things, you know, so fortunately I was able to get to be on TV and I was able to get some filmmaking training, basic, and from then I started thinking that, um, I need to take this further, you know, because um, I feel there, there is a lot of injustice that has been done in filmmaking in Africa, because most of the important films, the important stories that are stories of Africa have been told by people from Europe or America who came in and maybe just spent like a week or a month or so, and then go back and made a film, you know, and I felt like we are the best people to tell our stories because this is what we are this is who we are we are around the society we are we are the people that live here and we see every day how um, things unfold in our country do we have a lag in the office? and then it's for me it's injustice for um foreigners to just we are here so i think like I had to take filmmaking further and, you know, tell uh, the stories of my people. So I set up the, the Feature View Media Center, which was originally a Feature View Film Group, um, purposely to, to tell the stories of Sierra Leoneans by Sierra Leoneans, because I feel like 
that is the best way we can do justice to these stories. So I've been able to, you know, do some little travel. I've been to the IDFA in Amsterdam. I've been to the US maybe two times in film workshops and trainings, you know, and, uh, but I decided to come back because I felt from the beginning that I need to, you know, set up this system that where we can tell our stories so that we'll do justice to our people. And that is what I'm doing. All right, Tyson, we thank you very much for what you are doing. Um, it is going to take us, um, Sierra Leoneans, to bring light to what's going on in our country. We cannot let other people outside of Sierra Leone tell Sierra Leone's story, Sierra Leone's history, or talk about Sierra Leone people as a whole. Um, so for me, I already spoke to you before. I already gave you my gratitude about how amazing this film work, um, this film was. Um, and the sentiments also carry with everybody else that's coming here today because, you know, it's one thing to... Uh, see a documentary and uh you you feel attached to it but it's something else when it's your backyard something that you're so close to that has affected not maybe may not affect you directly but you know somebody who may know somebody that this has been affected by and uh when i watched it i'm i'm very emotional i i started to cry maybe halfway through uh the documentary um that's when i knew it was important that's when i knew uh when this idea to speak to you came about i knew i wanted to be a part of it because i wanted to be a part of you know this this history making moment to give Sierra Leone the light that normally doesn't get um given Thank you to C uh, BBC Africa for highlighting this film, um, bringing it to, to us in the diaspora, uh, because you know how hard it is for us to get, you know, images from Sierra Leone while we're over in America, the UK, or wherever we're in the world. So I want to thank them. I most definitely want to thank you and um, thank everybody that's here. What I'd like to do is I'd like to start this um, this program by playing the introduction of your uh, your BBC Africa documentary for everybody in case some people have not seen it so they can get a, a you know a, a nice introduction of what the film is if you guys will allow me to do so. I know fine. You would tell me to me, Sabi. Mothers, daughters, sisters, outcasts, meet Lady P and the sex workers of Makini, Sierra Leone. Some of them, they are my sisters. Some of them, they are my colleagues. And some of them, they are my. Come and see. But this is not a world full of fun and laughter. For the daughter, you know, pay you, beat you, rape you, and they do this, and then they call sex worker. It's a job that can cost them their life. Rather get the girl owner, rather get a person born. If me begin to do anything, part and cut and can kill her. Some will suffer a terrible death. Those who live will have their lives changed forever. What's happening? What's happening? And some will emerge with new hope. <laughs> this is the story of a group of women who want justice, who want a better life. Let me say, I don't really receive so many pains than I think. So I hope safe me picking can be by. They will fetch for me, fetch for the one day sees advantage by. All right, thank you very much. Hold on one brief moment. All right, hopefully that played on you guys end very well as it did on mine. Um, 
So, uh, yeah, so that is the intro to uh, Mr. Tyson Conte's uh, documentary on BBC Africa. Um, that was played directly from um, their YouTube channel as well. Um, so now that we're here, we can go ahead and get the program started. Uh, Sia, would you like to lead um, with the questions? Uh, the first question on our, our, our list? Yeah. Um, is Tyson, I, is he on the screen? I don't see him. Hold on one moment. All right. Okay, I don't see him. So let's wait one brief moment. He may have um, been logged out. Uh, All right. Y'all bear with us. He is in Africa yeah. and there are challenges with the internet sometimes. All yeah, right. He's currently in my <laughs> Um, So, you know, how, you know, Afrocell, Airtel, Orange, whichever. Um, I'm going to... Um, send him a message on WhatsApp. Okay. So while she's going ahead to do so, um, I'll actually continue to play some of the documentary as well. Um, so we can have that going while we're waiting for Tyson to uh, join us again. Hold on one brief moment, everybody. April, 2020, coronavirus arrives in Makini, one of Sierra Leone's biggest cities. Few will help those who fall seriously ill in the streets for the fear of catching COVID. They are left to die. The scars caused by the Ebola epidemic six years ago run too deep. We don't see what this is sickness can do. And the nation and the world. And the universe. That's not the only way they will have a My name is Tyson Conte. I am a Sierra Leonean filmmaker. <laughs> Makeni is my hometown. You can feel the pandemic panic in the air. We call it Wahala, a local word which means fear, crisis, chaos. As the virus spreads and the government curfew kicks in, Chaos is all around me. Long before COVID-19, many in this city we are struggling to survive. Coronavirus is making that struggle harder, and McKinney sex workers know that better than most. Now, every client counts even more than usual. I want to. That's right. I wait for you, Jaya. Even though their job is legal, sex workers don't get government cash to ease the impact of coronavirus, unlike many others. Viewed as immoral outcasts in a seedy underworld, many Sierra Leoneans think sex workers are best shunned and avoided. Hey, sir, I'm not fine. You would tell me to me, Sabi. I confess, I thought the same. But when I heard these women were begging for food, I felt sympathy for them especially when so many others are receiving government handouts. Welcome to the world of Lady P. Here is my residence. All of them, they are tenants. Some of them, they are my sisters. Some of them, they are my colleagues. And some of them, they are my... <laughs> Come and see. All right. <laughs> Princess Kuruma, also known as Lady P. So we have regained our connection with Tyson. Um, Tyson, are you there? Hi, guys. Yes, sorry, I got kicked out of the, the conversation. But no problem. Glad that I'm back now. All right, no problem, no problem. All right. Um, so, see you. Go ahead. Yeah. 
Um, so I'll just start off by saying um, watching this documentary really touched me because it could have been one of my sisters um, and just seeing um, the plight of the women just trying to survive on a daily. Um, I think Ishmael said it definitely being from Sierra Leone, having family from Sierra Leone and seeing that, um, you know it's there, but then to see it with your visual eyes, it comprehends in a different way. So we're gonna jump into some of the uh, questions that we have for you, Tyson, and just feel free to expound. Um, and if there's any other questions that you guys have for Tyson, go ahead and start populating that in the comment box so we can get those, okay? Um, so one of the questions was, what made you want to share the plight of sex workers in um, Salon? We know that you talked about um, filmmaking and sharing stories, but why specifically sex workers? Um, so I think I've come to realize that um, sex workers are as human as any other person around the society, and um, that they deserve the same justice as the woman working in the bank, they deserve the same justice as the woman working in an office. Uh, but this is something that they are not getting, which is one thing that um, really um, pushed me to want to tell their story because the most important thing is, as you know, Sierra Leone, because of the religious background, sex workers are not people that people want to discuss, you know from the government, from NGOs, from the, the, the religious people. I mean, people don't want to discuss them, you know? So, and I, I thought that, no, it's high time we start to discuss them because if we don't discuss them, we are pushing them every day to the edge, which is why they are going through the, 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 the kind of, horrible things that they, are, they have to go through. I think once we start discussing them and think of a way to improve their conditions, and then we'll bring them back into the society and to, they, we all will live in harmony. And so that's one thing that I think above all the groups of people in society, these are the most marginalized people because they are associated with so many things. People associate them as, you know, criminals. They associate them as sick people. Maybe they think they have HIV and AIDS. They think they have a different kind of sexual transmitted diseases. And then you don't want to talk to them. Even if, I mean, it's a member of your family, people don't want to talk to them. I mean, they, they, they think like when you are a sex worker, you are out of the family. You are in your own world. And so people will leave you in your own world. You have no support from the family, not from the society. And so that is one thing I want to change. That is one thing I aim at that this documentary should change those narratives and people who start discussing the sex workers. Okay. Now, um, Tyson, thank you very much for that um, answering that question. So my question to you would be, um, you know, with everything that Sierra Leone has been through from the war, uh, Ebola, mudslide and everything of that, how has those situations and those um, history changing moments in our country impacted the, the growth of sex workers um, in Sierra Leone? Well, I think that has impacted, um, it has a, a, a lot of impact on the growing numbers of the sex workers. Um, according to statistics, we have about 146,000 sex workers in Sierra Leone. That's an alarming number. Yes, that's alarming. You know, so um, you can imagine, for example, Lady P, she was forced into sex because of um, the way the war left her. I mean, she was, she was growing up having the love and care from the parents. Unfortunately, she has to go through this horrible thing that she was watching whilst her parents were, have, were being slaughtered. And, you know, she had to travel out of the country, um, going to Liberia for some time and then come back to find a country with no direct relative to look after you, to provide for you. So immediately, you know, 
her life has been shattered. And then with no support, after the, the end of the war, there was no support for these people to at least shake them up and, you know, support them to go through education. So she had to, I mean, join her colleagues on the streets just to survive. And this is um, in, the, in the early 2000s, this is the main cause of sex workers in Sierra Leone. Most of the sex workers in those days are all being forced by the war to go to the streets. And that's a similar scenario when you think of, or when you talk about the Ebola, you know, it's killed a lot of people and Lady P has to go through another, I mean, after being on the streets, she find this guy who, who, who fall in love with her, who marry her and she was living a normal life. She had to give back to two children and then Ebola came and snatched all these people away from her, the husband, the children and all. You know, so, and she felt like, wow, I still have to go back to continue. But then, so, I mean, that's that's telling you how much um, um, these things has impacted the lives of these women, especially, you know, in, we are not the people who an uncle or aunt can step in to provide immensely for a lost relative's daughter or, I mean, child. You know, and so this struggle pushes these women to, to go to the streets because they are women. You can think of the men, they can go out there and do some physical work, even though it's not easy for them, but they are men, they can do that. But the women are very vulnerable, they are challenged. They may want to do that, but they are not physically strong. So the, the, the only way they think we can survive is, you know, a simple trade, I go out and don't force anybody, but whosoever wants to meet me can come and meet me and pay me money and then I'll go back home and leave. You know, that, that, that was supposed to be a very simple thing to do, but then it is becoming the most dangerous job to do in Sierra Leone, you know, because of the background, because of the way, I mean, Sierra, you know, in Africa, we, we normally don't, now that we are into the 21st century, people are starting to think of women as compared to men. But before now, women are people that we consider to be, you know, in the house, to be in the kitchen, you know, to take care of the kids. You don't give them challenges in life, you know. So people don't normally regard women as men. So that is, that is the case. Um, I'm going to be going back and forth from the questions that we have and the questions that are in um, the comment box. Um, one of the things that we discussed in the group, um, there could be a perception from this documentary that when you first come into uh, knowing who Lady P is, it could be seen as if she is somewhat taken advantage of the women. But as you go into the story, you see, you learn more about her story. So what was your, I guess, um, perspective or intake when you first met Lady P and um, covering um, the documentary? Uh, so first I want to, I, I, I would like to tell you guys how I came him to know a series of episodes on 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 the outbreak of corona and i heard that there is this woman called lady p who is the chair lady of the sex workers in mckinney that is going from house to house to beg for food i was shocked i was curious and I decide to meet Lady P. And when I found Lady P, I was even shocked that I come to learn that, you know, when we have the first three days lockdown, the government was giving um, um, some money, food to some challenged groups, for example, the disabled, the vulnerable. But these ladies, these women, sex workers, they were not considered. No one gave them anything. And when you have a curfew, and at that time the curfew was at nine o'clock, 
you've already closed the business of the sex workers here because they only go out in the night to work. And so if you ask them not to go out after nine, that means they are not going to make their money. You stop them from making their money. So I think these we are supposed to be the first people that you think of that other people, the traders and other people can go out during the day and sell. But the sex workers work mainly in the night and there is a curfew. So their business is closed. Upon that, you have the three days lockdown where everybody has to be indoors for like three days, 72 hours. And it's been about maybe two weeks before, two weeks in the curfew before the three days lockdown. So you've shut these people down for two weeks. They are not making money. And then you are going to lock them for 72 hours. So they were in indoors hungry for the rest of the 72 hours. They don't get food. And when the 72 hours was over, um, they, everybody was open, the lockdown was open. And in about a week, they announced another 72 hours of lockdown. So Lady P knew what they had gone through in the past 72 hours of the lockdown. And the government has not come in or NGOs has not stepped in to provide for them. She has to gather all her team, all the women around her to say, we cannot go into the lockdown without food. We will die of hunger. So what we do is we have to put ourselves to the lowest, going house to house, office to office to beg for food so that when we go in for the next 72 hours, we can have food, you know? So that was really, for me, that was unfair to them. And so I became interested I felt sympathy for them and um, that's how I got to meet them. And yes, like you said, when I met Lady P, I was thinking she was, you know, organizing these girls, you know, to go out, make money and bring back to her. And then she was making money from them. Unfortunately, well, unfortunately, fortunately, um, that's not the case. That's not the case, you know, because um, I've been so close to everyone, everyone been so close to them for about maybe six or more months and not once have I heard from any one of them that Lady P demands a percent from the money we make. So from knowing Lady P and her story, she told me she has been through so much in life and she's a sex worker. She knows what she's been through. That is why she wants to do all that she can to make sure these young girls know their rights, have their rights. And before now, she has been like an advocate for sex workers when they are in trouble, when they are in trouble, when they have issues with the law. Because most times the police go out in the night. I mean, that's also an unfair treatment. You can be in the club with all the other people, then the police will come and leave all the other people and arrest the sex worker because of the way they dress, because of the way they look, they will arrest them for loitering. Whereas there are hundreds of people in the club who are not, um, who are not arrested all because of the way they look, you know. So Lady P has to be the advocate. Anytime any one of them was arrested, Lady P, and Lady P will go to the radio stations to advocate on their behalf that the treatment that they are getting is unfair to them. But people don't want to listen. You know, most times she told me when she went to the radio and when she starts, you know, putting across their problems, then they will shut her down and, you know, just cut the interview short. You know, so uh, that was why um, she and all the rest were open you know, for me to give them that voice because she said, I have been running around this town trying to get our voice heard, but no one listened. And if you want to give us that voice, we'll give you our all to make sure our voice been heard. So I am just very happy that their voices have been heard by people locally and internationally. All right, thank you. Uh, wow, uh, that was a lot. Uh, so Tyson, um, 
you know the, the like you was just talking about uh with Ebola um with the mudslide everything that's happened and now the coronavirus that's you know plaguing the rest of the world is just seems as though um the less fortunate countries have to suffer for it maybe three times four times five times worse than us that are in the diaspora um as far as let's say outside of the coronavirus and everything the lockdown and uh everything that's going on how can the environment for these uh sex workers be improved um what do you think needs to happen because i'm I'm gonna ask two questions um so they both go hand in hand how can this the environment be improved for sex workers and how can we change the mindset that is had of women being property um in sierra leone especially in africa period or in the, in the old world the idea that women are property and the conditions of which sex workers are working, how can those conditions change and how do we go about changing the mindset that women are property to men? Um, so I think the awareness, you know, I, I think for me, like I said, um, because of the religious background, even I was not, you know, that sympathetic to sex workers. I had never had issues with them. You know, I go, I go to the club every day. I see them, I respect them. I never had issues with them. I never felt they are bad people, but I was not that sympathetic. But because I was able to come close to them and get the awareness, listen to their real stories and felt like this is, they, they are human. They feel pain just like myself and all the rest of humanity. And that's all they needed is to live. That's all what they need. They just need to live. You know, the sex workers don't, they don't need to be wealthy. They don't need to be rich. They can want to, but they don't need that city where they are respected, where their rights are protected. But due to the lack of awareness, the society does not give them this um, opportunity, which is very, very, um, which is very, very interesting. Because when you feel like, when you realize we've been unjust to a certain group of people for quite a long time, and that we just need to, you know, re We're having technical lags real quick, ladies and gentlemen. Please be patient while we wait for Tyson to reconnect. While we wait for him to reconnect, maybe we can just have a discussion amongst ourselves. If there's some comments you want to share um, in regards to the interview or just things that you're feeling in regards to um, this topic, please feel free to share. Uh, like we said, Tyson is in Sierra Leone, West Africa right now, and there are always challenges when it comes to the internet. All right, so um, we see Samuel Toure. Um, if you'd like to unmute yourself um, and speak. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I, I, I think this is a quite very interesting topic, um, and I want to say uh, a big thank you to Tyson for picking up that short kind of story. And um, with looking at the context, I think um, knowing the kind of story that we need to tell, there's something like um, something kind of a, a kind of a difficult decision, considering the, um, what Thailand has been known for internationally. You know, you're talking about the, the, the war, talking about Ebola, talking about um, all of these things. But I think um, looking at other, uh, the other aspect of it is that um, you asked a very important question. How do we um, ensure the society accept some of these things? You know, the challenges um, uh, that surround some of these things you will consider is one, um, the society don't accept this. That's one thing that we need, we need to look at in the first place. So secondly, the environment, looking at the maybe any policy level or human rights, um, 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 considering that they, they, do, they do also do have rights to their decision. As to maybe what what is it that they want to do those environments are not enabling for them 
So even when you see them um, at night doing their business, nobody cares about them or giving them that respect. When you see them at night, you see them in the afternoon, they will be discriminated. So it's a lot of other issues around that kind of um, um, EM kind of um, set of people. Um, we call them the minority. But if again you look at it, they are aligned with um, people like the the gay. The same the same discrimination. The same environment is not enabling. If you check in the law of Sierra Leone, you will never find any law that talks about giving rights to sex workers. There, the police will always use force on them, arrest them, just because they will tell you this is not a law for them. So there is a lot of things attached to that. But there is one thing that we don't talk about and that I think we need to raise. That is the psychological aspect of it, you know, because at the end of the day, I mean, many of, we have actually led projects where we engage them to let them understand um, you can do, you can be better than this, or you can maybe, we, we, we can be able to engage you into skill work and then get you with a startup and then you start a business. So when you get them into some of these things to maintain them there, it's just like a lifestyle. It's difficult sometimes to get them out because the psychological aspect, their mind is not actually been made up, like uh, not, not connected. They see that it's an easy way to get money and to make life out of it. So there's a lot of things attached to this. I really appreciate what the young man has done, but I think there's, there's a long way to go to cover this story because we just talk about one section. There's a lot of other things that we need to look at. The, the enabling environment, which has to do with the societal uh, behavior, and that's of looking at the psychological aspect, which has to do with the individual in total. So I just want to like throw light on this. Um, I'm sure there's a lot more to discuss about it, but I don't want to take all the time. Um, yeah, I'm just signing off and I'm, I think I should leave in the meeting anyway, but thanks. This is a very insightful discussion. I really, really happy to hear all of these things. And we hope that this kind of discussion will guide to something else that will influence behavioral and policy related things that could protect them as well, knowing fully that this is their right, whatever they choose to be. Thank you. No, thank you. Um, that you did bring up very important points. Uh, these are uh, talking points that we have discussed um, that we are going to highlight during this conversation. Uh, you know, we just we just want to know what the we know where it started. We know the impact that it's had on the country. We know the that a lot of these decisions that these women have to make, um, they're not doing it because they they want to. Sometimes it's the only way of survival. Um, is it's no other choice for them. Is it because nobody chooses to want to be a sex worker? They don't have opportunities. That's where we have to look at government. We have to look at policies. We have to look at um, whatever whatever is going on in the country in total. In total, we need to know what can the government do. Let, let me pause. What can we do? Um, those of us that are the youth, what those of us that are in the diaspora, to then put the influence in the government to try to protect these people by offering a, offering job training, creating more jobs, and being very, very forceful in education in a country. Because we can create all these jobs in a world that we want to, but it has to start somewhere. We have to start with the education of our people. And uh, illiteracy in Sierra Leone is one of our biggest issues. You can't expect these people to want to get the, the best jobs that require them to speak English, that requires them to know a level of writing English or things of that nature if the country is not taking it upon themselves, the onus, to want to educate the country. So we have so many ways to go. We have so many layers that we have to break down. And this conversation, for me, I believe is a start because we, we're hearing it directly from somebody that's on the ground. A lot of the stories that we hear from Sierra Young, we hear from a third party. For, to hear a story from somebody that actually took time out of their personal life to document something, to bring it to light, and to do it in such a way that it grabs the attention of people. Like, I'm, I, I have a very short attention span. Two minutes after watching the video, if it doesn't catch my attention, I go to the next. The fact that I was able to sit there three different times and watch this video from start to finish, just so I can formulate certain questions in my head to ask him to deep dive into what's really going on and get his input is something that's captivating to me and um mm -hmm. i don't want to talk too much because tyson is back um uh so we're going to continue with the questions that we have for tyson all right um go ahead see ya. Um, so as a lot of people were walking watching this documentary um there were a lot of uh parts where i heard people say they had to stop watching it come back and watch it 
because it was very triggering. I know for me it was. Um, so two part question, um, what was the hardest scene that you personally felt could not be placed in the documentary? And then also there was a point in the video where we seen there was a girl that was murdered and just the description of how she was murdered, I think, um, really took us all at surprise. Um, so if you can just kind of touch on those, please. Um, well, I think for me, um, the part that I was not so proud of to, you know, bring into the film is the fact that um, I had to, you know, show these women's faces, you know, um, but I think that that was their decision, which which was why I had to do that. You know, I was like, I had to, you know, blow your faces and, you know, so you will not be identified. And they were like, director, why? We are so many in this country. Yes, um, making a film about sex workers is one of the most difficult things you can ever imagine because they don't normally want to be identified as sex workers because of the stigma that surrounds. And so they were like, if, if we don't make this film for the fact that everybody knows us in our community as sex workers, we are still stigmatized. And if we don't make this film in telling our, I mean, showing our identity and, you know, what would people think? It would be like people will be lost. People don't know actually who are these people because the whole film was about sex workers. And so if you had to blow our faces, then people would be lost, like, who are these people? And for them, it was like, they felt like there would be a lot of attachments to their story when they are identified as human than when they are blood and cannot be identified. They said, we are willing to, you know, give it all for this film because we want our story to be a changed one. We want to change our story. And so if we, 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 if you blow our faces and then possible people think like we can support these women, but the people will not know how to locate or who to support because they, they can't identify us it's every day. It's not a new thing. It's a common thing for us. So you had to. And I was like, really? Don, I come to it that yes, it makes a lot of difference when you see them than when you don't see them. And so, but it was hard for me, but I had to, because um, I, I had to, after the film, I had to come to them and screen the film before it was released. And after screening the film, I, I was like, I am going to blow all your faces. And so we had this discussion for a very long time. And finally, I had to agree to what they say. And at the end of the day, I felt like it makes so much difference when you can recognize them than when you can't, you know. So, I mean, it's just bring the whole film alive. You see them, you know that this is the, this is the truth and all these things. So, but that is difficult for me. Um, yes, so the lady that was murdered, I mean, I, I was not able to dig deep because um, I am also, you know, you also had to be skeptical because you know the politic system in our country. And I don't have, I don't want to have issues with the police, you know, so from what the, the girls told me and I, I had to find, I had to do some further research and I found out that that lady came all the way from Kono to do her sex business in Makini, you know. Yes, yeah, so she came to Makini and in the night we have a popular place called Garden State where like everybody turn up to in the night and these sex workers go there to, you know, get their clients. She was there with her colleagues and this guy came and you know, like a client, they agreed and they left. The next day, she was murdered, she was mutilated. 
you know, and that actually creates a lot of panic among them because of the way she was murdered. You know, she was murdered because of a ritual something, because if it was just people want to kill her, they would just kill her. But she was killed and most of her body parts were removed before she was dumped in a bush. Her feet, her arms, her private parts was all removed. You know, so you can already tell that this is this has to do with money ritual, you know. So yeah, that is also another another bitter thing. But I felt like um she's dead and gone. So I wouldn't want people to recognize her face. That was why I had to, you know, discuss with um, the people from BBC and we had to blow the pictures. I mean, it was you can add a, you can tell that um this is someone that has been killed, but um, you cannot identify her because I felt like we we owe her that that much. Yeah, that's that was probably one of the hardest things for me to watch. Um, because even it, with with a blur, you can you can see um if you look close enough, you can tell uh yeah. that her body parts were mutilated and things of that nature. Now, um, yeah. Outside of the sex work, is there is there opportunity in Sierra Leone where sex workers um, can change their lives, right? Or does this stigma of sex work follow them forever once they've been entangled? Because you know they they say everywhere else in the world is you get a second opportunity to change uh, to change perception, right? So their first perception that people see them as is sex workers. Are they then able to transition out of that sex work business? and go into a field um, that offers them education, uh, better job placement and things of that nature. Does the country offer that? Or does McKinney specifically offer these women the opportunity to get away from sex work and become something more than what society deems uh, sex workers uh, to be? Uh, well, I, I would like to say to you, um, the film was all based on McKinney, but I had to do research, not only McKinney, I had to go to Freetown and spend months in Freetown researching and filming with some sex workers. Um, um, we are now thinking with BBC to make a longer version of the film where we can bring in some of those stories in Freetown to up to 90 minutes, uh, because um, the slot that BBC has was 50 minutes maximum and all these things. So we had to leave a lot of the stories. Uh, but now that we are feeling like the film is impacting people, we want to have a festival version of the film wherein we can, you know, extend it to 90 minutes. Um, I think a lot of that has been shot. Um, uh, uh, back to your question, I feel like the society has not offered sex work has this opportunity and so you cannot tell if they can actually move on and you know have a second chance this is something that is all new which is why um you know even in in in, in sierra leone the film is welcome because they, they, this has been among the young generation this has been something that they have been contemplating they have been talking about but they they don't have they can't give the voice they don't, they don't want to come up to say, let's discuss this. And so once they, had, they, they, they saw this film, they felt like this is an opportunity. You know, one day I was at a national television and I had to leave my contacts. On my way, I got like maybe 50 calls from sex workers in Freetown to say, thank you. You are our hero. You give us this voice. I am a sex worker. I live in Freetown. This is something that we had wanted to see all along, but there is no one that has come to 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 our concerns. And but you have done it you, a lot. My phone keep ringing, and they keep calling to say thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, so I I know if the society really give them this second chance, I feel yes, they can move on because among them. They don't want to continue. For example, Lady P, for example, Nata, who is a mother of three. The husband or the man that um, she gave back for the last child is in prison. So the, the, all of the three children don't have a father except the one and the last one. And this last one that really has a father to claim that this is my daughter is now in prison serving a 25 years time. So Nata was left to look after three children and one is around six years. 
So she was like, director, I am really ashamed of myself. I had to leave my baby who was who is around, you know, one year, one year, one month. But I started leaving her when she was four months. I leave her in the night with my older daughter, who's about six years, and go out to make money so I can feed them. I don't want to do that, but I had to. I have no one to support me. But I'm feeling so ashamed of myself because my daughter is coming of age and she's realizing that every night mommy has to leave us to go out. What is mommy doing? If she grows up and I was still in this business, she will feel like this is all good and she will come into the same business, you know? So you, 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 you can tell from all the explanations, they want to do, they want to go out and learn trade. They want to do catering. They want to do hairdressing. They want to do this. They just want to do something that will engage them and they will make some money and that they don't have to go to the streets to make money to feed themselves and their children. So I believe if society give them a second chance, they can have a second life. Wow, that's really deep, Tyson. Um, I wanna applaud you for doing this documentary. Um, the next question is, were there any fears when you um, kind of ventured out to start to do this documentary? Were your friends and family supportive or were they against you doing this documentary? Well, I, I mean, you can see they were, they were not so supportive because um, they felt like, like any other person, they felt like, um, I mean, you, you, you can have better stories out there to do. Why, why sex workers? Why sex workers? You know, so I'll be, you know, my phone, directly on my phone. Some people living on the media were like, why does he have to film sex workers? Why does he have to tell the stories of sex workers? I mean, why is sex workers? You, have, you can have a better story. Okay, so you want to say we have to encourage sex workers? Is it a good thing? Is it a good thing? God is against this. Religion is against this. You don't have to do that, you know. But I was like, God creates these people. He gave them life. He brought them into this world. One thing I, this is the life that nature and society has subjected them to. And if I'm going against them, for me, it's like I go against what um, God has destined these people to be. All they need is someone to give them a voice and I am in a better position or I'm in the right position to give them this voice. Why should I hold myself back? Because you guys are calling me, my friends and, you know, even my uncle, because my uncle one day called me and say, if your father was alive, I know he would not support you doing this. Why do you have to do this? I was like, okay, my father is dead and gone and now I have my life to live. So this is what I want to do, you know, and I do it. Uh, I was afraid at some point because the police can just come to these people, to this women's house and just raid them during the day, in the night. They'll just come and raid them and arrest whosoever and lock them up. And when I was making this film for many months, I was always in the house in the morning, in the night, you know, I was coming close to them, building the trust between myself and them and trying to know them more, become intimate with them. So at some point I was afraid because one day I, I went there and I spent some hours with Lady P and I came back. On my way, before I reached my house, Lady P called me that director, I have been arrested by the police. I said, why? She said, they just came to the house as you left. They came to the house and they raided us, but they couldn't find anything that is a crime, but they had to arrest me and I am in this, this in, in police cell. That was like, wow. So if I was there for like maybe 30 minutes, I could have been arrested too, you know? So I was somehow scared, but I had to go to the police and, you know, to advocate on her behalf that why is she arrested? And they were like, they went to read, they got information. So that was why they went to read. But 
they couldn't find anything. So I was like, okay. So you had to release her. And the LUC was like, he's not going to talk to me because I'm a journalist. If I want him to talk to me, I have to talk to the police media person first. You know, so I had to make calls to the police media person, discuss, and eventually she was released after many hours in the cell, you know. So that was also one thing that was making me scared because I had to come there in the night to film them in the night, to be around them in the night. And then you, you are thinking of the police coming to raid this house, this area, that you have sex workers or you have rally boys around here who smoke push, who smoke um, um, weed and all these things, you know? So yeah, that was why, that was what making me um, being scared when I was making the film, you know. But thankfully, I was not arrested. <laughs> well, of course, we want to. We're definitely grateful that you weren't arrested. Um, I'm of the belief that uh, women should be able to do whatever they choose to do with their bodies. It is not up to men or government or religion to police it. Um, because at the end of the day, we all have to live our lives um, based on what our decisions are. And if everybody who believes in religion believe there's a day of judgment, you will have to answer for your for your decisions when that day comes. Um, my biggest concern is where, what does Sierra Leone, does McKinney offer these women a uh, sexual education um, and with the ideas of STDs, STIs, HIV, and also does the health department in Sierra Leone, specifically McKinney, offer these women the opportunity to have access to condoms and uh, things of that nature. Uh, so the question literally is, um, uh, is, is uh, how can sex workers be educated on sexual health, STDs, HIV, STI, and preventatives uh, such as uh, condoms? Um, so from what I've had from them and what I've seen, um, the health departments, don't give um, them education. I mean, um, they, they, even themselves are not comfortable with, you know, when it's come to testing, they are not comfortable with going to the hospitals because there is this thing that is growing in Sierra Leone where like, once you go out for a test and you happen to have one of these um, diseases that people are afraid of, then that information would go out to the society and you wouldn't know how it goes out you know so that is that is that is pathetic I mean, because as doctors they were supposed to you know respect the privacy of the patients and then keep their secrets so but there is this ngo called um, advocate and roda who are sometimes offering them condoms, lubricants, and give them an opportunity to do tests. We are in, they have a DNC, uh, which is mainly for, um, for them. Um, sometimes they come to their house with the test kits and then do the test with them. And if anyone has a condition, then they will keep it. And so I think they trust these people which is why they, they are very comfortable with them, you know. However, I would say the education is not that, um, it's not that effective as one would think because these NGOs are not basically set up for sex workers. They are set up for women. And so they can only give a share of their time and resources to the women. And I think what they've been doing for them is just you know, so once in a month or twice, give them condom and do a test if you want to, and that's it. All right, thank you very much for that. Um, Sia? So I think the big thing that we're focused on and why we're all here, um, 
we appreciate the information you're giving us, the awareness um, that you are exposing us to as far as the lifestyle, the needs, um, the concerns. Um, a lot of us want to know, we as children of Sierra Leone, um, how do we bring awareness? What can we do um, to be a voice and an advocate for these women, these children, um, and help to protect them? Tyson, were you able to hear that? What? Oh, did you not hear the question? <laughs> no. Okay. Um, so basically the question yeah, is please, how... Sorry, is, sorry. It's okay. How we um, as children of Sierra Leone, um, how do we bring awareness to this? It is an epidemic in itself. Um, and how do we go about supporting um, and assisting to help in the protection of these sex workers um, and some of the things that are um, impeding them as far as like policies, as far as the police, um, what can we do to help? Well, I think um, first is to, you know, target key stakeholders and dialogue with them, especially the governments, to see how they can provide um, better environment security and educate the police as well. Um, because most times from advocate, they told us that the police themselves, most times when they arrest these sex workers and take them to their cells, they do sleep with them, you know, which is horrible, yes. Um, they do that, you know. And for also, if you see in the film, you have Aisata, who was taken by the police and was beaten up and nothing was done. Not even an, an investigation was started as to why you had to beat a sex worker, you know, so. I think that is one thing that we all have to do to try and engage these lawmakers on how they can help improve the lives of these women, on how they can educate the police and other people. And I also think um, that you guys, um, together with the people from Sierra Leone, if the support is there, we can start a um, series of education programs, not only for the sex workers, but for the society, you know, we are in, we'll be going on radios, televisions, one by one to one, to talk to people and educate them about these people. And obviously change the way they feel and the way they think about them. Also, I think um, one of the challenge this sex workers are going through that that will tell you how bad it is for them is that people don't want you know to rent them their houses to stay which is why in 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 just about three rooms ADP has more than 30 of the sex workers living in those three rooms because they cannot go and rent a place. Once the landlords know they are sex workers, they don't give them their houses. Even if they gave you the house before finding out, they will give them their money and ask them to leave because people don't want to associate with them, which is something they've been so concerned about. That director, one thing that will give us peace is if we can find a place that will stay and that will not face stigma from people or the society. They say when we live in houses, we, are, we have to let, we are not respected, 
Our privacy is not respected. Our neighbors stigmatize us and we even face issues with our landlords because we are sex workers, you know? So um, this, is, this is all the things that is putting them into maybe a lot of trauma and they had to, you know, sometimes they had to go into drugs to make sure they just feel comfortable. But I believe if we set up systems where we can not only educate the sex workers, but educate the society, we can get rid of um, all the bad influence that they have to go through. For example, um, we can educate the sex workers and you know take them off do those that are on drugs we can pull them off drugs because i mean it's difficult for them that you have to live a life where every day you have to be ashamed to go out of your house because you think when i go out people would be pointing fingers at me oh she's going to sell herself she's going to sell her body you know that's very difficult but that's how society is to them so i think the awareness like i said earlier if we can okay let's give it a little bit of a moment it might be a lag in his audio have the supports to make sure we actually embark on what they are going through about sex workers that will make that that will make that will make the their their lives so so better yes that will make their life and when they get in a peace then their life will be better right. definitely thank you for that um thank you for that tyson um so my next question um because I'm always of, you know, finding solutions and we, we know what the problem is. The problem is sex trafficking. The problem is, um, you know, lack of health care. The problem is lack of education. Um, does Sierra Leone offer mental health and trauma recovery? <laughs> All right, Tyson, could you hear me? Sorry, guys. Sorry. No problem. Does the the serial offer uh, mental health or uh, trauma recovery re um, resources for for these women? Um, because you know it is something that is very traumatic to have to put yourself in a position where you feel as though in order for you to make ends meet, which is sometimes for them between seven dollars to fifteen dollars a night uh, that they make in total in total for selling their their bodies and putting themselves at danger. Um, it, it, it takes a very traumatic experience on the person. Um, so does Sirion offer those resources for them, trauma recovery and mental health issues uh, to speak to somebody? Um, because, you know, we are also, most of us are here are Sirionians when, when they say, oh, this person, this person don't clear, it's, it's not really that. It's literally, they have issues that they cannot really explain as is happening in real time. So for these women that have these, they there's no way you can't tell me that they don't have mental issues. Um, do they have the opportunity to get those resources available to them where they can take advantage of it? Or is it just something that they just have to figure out themselves? Because I watched the, the, the entire thing three times. I feel as though Lady P has a lot of trauma that she has never addressed. Um, so she's leading these other women who also have trauma and mental issues that they have never addressed. So it's somebody who's never gotten the proper help for mental issues and trauma assisting those who don't have access to that as well, which can be a problem to an extent, um, as much as good as Lady P is trying to do, you can't have the blind leading the blind. So I want to know where can these people get resources for trauma recovery and mental health? <laughs> I think he fell hey. off. 
the Wi-Fi in Salon. Wow. <laughs> um, so actually, what I want to do is while we're waiting for him to reconnect, I want to go back into the documentary and play a scene where he actually goes out at night and see these ladies at work. So if everybody can just um, be patient with me as I go ahead and get that streaming going. Uh, hold on one brief moment. Uh, where is the video? Okay. Give well, me it's just doing that. I just want to thank you guys for showing up and supporting and being part of the discussion. It's very important that we're engaged and aware on what is going on in our country. So I just want to thank you guys for showing up. Most, most definitely thank you guys for showing up. All right, let me go ahead and continue this right now. Distance is this so? How are you going to meet somebody who will help you? But we we'll get to leave you. Oh, go back, oh, no, get back, so the car, no, get to the it's Monday, the one pound, and need you money. This night, I am going to see sex workers go out for their business. We'll follow them to the streets and see where they do their business. There are more than 1,000 sex workers in Makini, normally working well into the night, hustling to survive. The coronavirus curfew now means they must be home by 11 p.m., slashing their income. Then, a shocking reminder of the risk sex workers must take to feed themselves and their families. Why that yes I didn't walk through so bad in Makamaya. I go pull in parts there. Right now we go for goats manners. Yeah, yes I did. Yes I eh, that lady will go kill. So right now we go for go out. Hey, this lady, eh? A picture of the murdered woman is doing the rounds on sex worker social networks. So this this is a sex worker. Sex worker. Pictures too of her mutilated body. Yes. 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 I'm on it. That goes so normal. We see the wrong go do so. You don't make me. I don't fear. I don't afraid. I don't afraid, man. Day. All right, thank you, thank you to everybody um, for watching that. Um, okay, we have Tyson back on here. Um, Tyson, sorry that we're having the network issues. Uh, we won't hold you very much more longer than uh, we have already. Um, so I'll go ahead, uh, see if you'd like to take the, the next uh, questions um, and then go from there. Uh, and yeah, thank you. Thanks, Ish. Um, so one of the questions is the young lady that was murdered. Um, there are a few people that would like to get an update on her child. How is her child doing? If you have any update on that. Uh -oh. You're you're on mute, Tyson. Uh, Tyson, we can't hold on. Let me let me see if I can unmute him. Hold on. Uh, 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 you can hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, so um, yes, Lugato is doing okay. She's living with the grandmother. Um, um, she's back in school. Uh, Sierra Leonean called um, Gaso. Ah, uh, no, sorry. 
corner, um, you know, um, helped the, the grandmother a few days ago with some money to get um, the Lugia to back to school uh, because uh, she thinks Lugia is supposed to be in school. She was um, going to school before the mother was killed, but um, the grandmother is unable to provide, so they are going through some challenges, but um, Kona has supported um, with um, some money and we got his back in school now. Thank you. Thank you definitely for uh, that update on uh, Rugiatu's uh, door. So if I could just ask a little question, normally, how much is it for us that are here? Um, we see stuff like that. We want to help um, for for school fees. What is that normally for the year, for the term, for the year? Uh, how much is that normally cost in uh, Makini, if I may ask? Um, well, it depends the kind of school that you want your daughter to go. Um, because if you want them to go to the government school for now, um, the school fees is free, but you had a lot of um, other things that you have to pay for that doesn't make difference from paying for the school fees. However, the, you can see the, the best schools are the private schools because um, of the, the level of learning that the kids get in that schools because of you know the crowd that you go you have in the government schools you know so um but if you want to if you want your your daughter to be in a private school wherein they can have the basic uh, they can have a very strong foundation uh, for example say you have to put them to sos um, that would be like four hundred dollars for the year you know um Yes, that will be a four hundred dollar per year, which is one of the best private schools around town. You can find others that are not that expensive, um, but you can also find some that are even more expensive. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. That that's something because that's something I'm looking to. Uh, like everybody wants to do something to to help Sierra Leone. And I believe, like I've said from the beginning, I feel like it starts from education. So um, because I have the opportunity here to make a decent amount of money, I wanted to be able to find certain kids in that country, no matter where, whether they're Makemi, Freetown, uh, Cornell, wherever, to try to help their family put these kids in school if that's something that they truly want to do. Um, I know sometimes they say it's best to go through organizations, but I want to be able to get to these kids directly um, because I feel like the, the, the way you change the country is to change the, the, the education system. And if they're educated from, from when they're young till they get older, those, are, those kids are going to be groomed to be the future leaders of Sierra Leone because they're seeing what's going on and everything that is wrong within the country. So instead of having somebody come from overseas and come to Sierra Leone and say, oh, I'm going to change Sierra Leone, you can't change it if you haven't lived here long enough and experienced the ins and outs, the days that you have to you know, go through without having water, consistent water, consistent electricity, and have to worry about uh, your health. If you get sick, would you be able to get the proper medical care? in um, Sierra Leone or would you have to go overseas? Um, so asking that question is basically me trying to figure out what I would need to do on my end, what I would need to plan in order to, to take initiative to try to help kids go through school because I believe they are the future um, of changing what we know Sierra Leone to be at this moment. Um, my next question is, we know that sex and human trafficking is a problem in Sierra Leone. Is this something that the government has the ability to eradicate or is it something that's just it just comes with the territory. Um, I think I, I think I will not say eradicate, but I think um, if the government puts more um, resources on that direction, they will help reduce. That greatly. You know, it will shock to know that one of the lady who was in McKinney with us whilst we were making this film and struggling to bring back Isata and IK has also been trafficked out. 
Yes. So, I mean, so that is how much it's, you know, and she was among the group of Lady Peace girls, you know, and, and th she was aware that um, trafficking is happening because she knows that Asata and Ike have been trafficked. They were all friends. They were all going out together. And she, all, she was also trafficked. And I, I, I mean, I don't have the, I have not been able to follow that story because I don't have the, the, the resources to follow that, you know. But she has been also trafficked out of the country. And, and I think even Lady P don't know where she is at the moment. Okay, and you just mentioned um, Isata and IK. Um, any update on them? Because we know that they they were um, trafficked all the way to Mali and then brought back to Freetown. Um, is there an update on those ladies since they've been back in, the, um, in Sierra Leone? Yeah, well, I think um, the updates on them is that from since they come back, um, I see really that they don't... They are so discouraged that they don't want to go back to the streets. And they have been trying hard to make sure they don't go out, to make sure they start a new life. But it is difficult for them, which is my fear, because they don't have the support. They come from a very poor background and that they don't get support. Um, normally when they come back, the IOM used to give them a repatriation fund um, when people are trafficked, but in their case, it's unfortunate. They were not given this support um, because they wanted to start a business so that they would stop from going to, to the streets. Um, so I've been able to support ISATA on my own to give her some little money, which she's using now and as a business. So she goes out in the morning to sell at Abacha Street and then comes back in the night, you know. So, but I mean, that's from that was just a small support, but that's that was what I can afford. And you know, and I case in Makini, and she has also not been um, supported. She had asked me that she also wants to do the same. But I told her when I have money, I will see what I can do for her too, because I've done something for Isata and Isata is now um, selling. And because she's selling, even though it is small, but I mean, she can live by, you know? So, but that is the updates on them. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so, uh, sorry, sorry, see if I'm if I'm oh, like taking no, over. No, go ahead, go ahead. Um, so Tyson, um, we know this is this is the first time we've been introduced to you as a filmmaker. Um, so my question to you is, uh, if you can just give us more information on uh, Future View uh, Media Center, uh, which you're involved in. Um, also, how do you guys operate? What do you do? Um, your source of findings and things of that nature. Can you give us a background on your Future View Media Center that you have in uh, Sierra Leone? Um, yes, so like I said earlier in, the, in my first introduction, I put together Future View Media Center because I felt like we are supposed to be responsible to tell our stories and that we can do justice to them because we know the society, we know our people. Um, so I bring this collective of filmmakers, um, but I should let you know that after the basic training I got from We On TV and, you know, being to the IDFA and to the Jackson Wild Summit, I came back and I started, you know, giving basic film training to um, the other guys. And so I was able to set up um, Feature View um, we are in now, we have about um, 11 main filmmakers that make up the crew. And for the moment, we have about 23 um, volunteers. Uh, um, but what we do is not only tell the stories, because one thing I realize is African films are not that competitive in the Western world as the films that are made by Europeans and Americans. 
And one thing I know, the reason is um, the technical level. I mean, that is why they don't normally make, uh, make it big at that stage because of you know, the, the technical know-how. You know, so I think what, what I was doing is setting up um, feature view to make primarily give training to young filmmakers you know, give training to them um, where they will have the basic training and then it's up to their talent to see how they can execute um, in making films. You know, unfortunately I've stopped um, the training because all the volunteers, the 23 volunteers, they are all young filmmakers that have come to learn. But I've stopped the training for about maybe a year or so because um, since I started, I've wrote a lot of um, letters, a lot of applications, a lot of proposals to, you know, external um, film grants and all these things to see how I can get support to continue um, making this dream come alive. But unfortunately, since I started Feature View way back in 2000, and, well, the Media Center started in 2012, um, I've never been supported by an individual or a group you know so what what i've been doing to make sure i continue keeping on is you know when when i got a job when i got a job in making um filming for some international ngos and that money which i will make from that um, job is what i use um to you know, keep future view running and then maybe extend um, the training because um, you, you, you need a lot of stuff to put together to make sure you have the training and, you know, buy equipment and all these things. But before the, the, the COVID, I was like, you know, jobs dried up and I was not able to secure a job where I can get money. So I stopped the training and since the coming of COVID, I've not been able to do any further training, but that is primarily the, the main purpose because I felt like if we give these young filmmakers, because we have a lot of people in here that are going into filmmaking now, so many of them, but you find out that the films hardly make it out there because um, we lack that know-how and me being opportune to at least have a basic learning, I thought like I have to you know, give back to these young people so that in the future, the filmmaking in Sierra Leone can improve and can be competitive, you know? So that is, um, that is how we operate. Um, we, we have an office now um, we are like, we come together every morning. Most of us, um, the, 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 the collective, most are dropouts and myself, I've just been back to school. I started studying for my um, degree program, but I've been dropouts for many years. And like myself, a lot of the other guys are dropouts and but I would come together every day and you know, think of what we do. So we, this is not actually the first film we made. Okay. Um, the first film we made for for BBC was um, in the 2014-15 Ebola outbreak. And I made a film called Standing Among the Living. It was also um, shown by BBC Africa Eye, you know. And, and apart from that, I've also made some series of short documentaries but mainly focusing on um, back here, I, like in 2018, I made another documentary I called um, um, Me and You, One People, that was focusing on dis disability, you know, that was creating awareness for people with disability, you know. That was also a film that, you know, made a lot of impact back here. And in 2017, I made up one which I call Cassava, is a winner, which was mainly focusing on how to make um, 
to teach farmers on how to cultivate cassava using the advanced method, which is more productive. Um, so but that film was mainly for the farmers. And so we had to take it to the village to do screening for the farmers to see and then discuss, you know, and it was also well received. So this is what we've been doing at Feature View. Um, like I said, we get support mainly on when we do a job, we get paid, and then that is what we use to maybe upkeep ourselves, get more equipment, um, feed ourselves, and continue making films. You know, so that is what um, Feature V is all about. <laughs> okay, um, because. Because I'm also a, a, um, a filmmaker, a filmmaker as well. Um, the fact that you know uh, I do notice uh, the lack of tech, uh, technology that Sierra Leone is offered as far as camera equipment, as far as actual like people learning how to really film and edit quality work. Um, I'm headed to Sierra Leone this December with other um, filmmakers coming from the US and we're actually planning to do a, um, a two or three day seminar where we're teaching how to film, how to edit, the proper programs to edit. We're also doing photography lessons as well. Um, and I'm also, I have a, I have a, a camera that I'm, I'm taking with me that I plan to, to give to somebody that I feel like could use it and make the best of having such a, a quality camera in their uh, disposal. But as far as you and your media company, myself, I would like to help financially. Um, and I would also like, Sia also said that she would also like to be a part of that. We are willing to raise money for you if you would accept it from us. Um, you know, some people don't like to, you know, get handouts, but if you would accept the money from us, we will raise money for you. I will start myself um, I will pledge a hundred dollars to your company right now and anybody else who is willing to, you know, put money together, you can, uh, either send, uh, myself or Sia a message and we can go ahead and do that. Um, in full transparency, we will be giving everybody an update where the money is going to make sure it's getting to you directly. Um, but I am going to go ahead. I will pledge, uh, right now to say that I will be donating a hundred dollars uh, to your company to make sure that you are able to revive it and you're able to give other filmmakers an opportunity to also tell stories um, because that is the only way we we are going to hear about those stories here. We can't have one or two people here and there do it. We have to have a collective of people being able to, you know, document something and show it from their lens because everybody tells us the same story from their lens completely different. Um, so again, I am going to go ahead and pledge a hundred dollars to your company. I will be posting my, um, my cash app or my, uh, PayPal link in this conversation for anybody who wants to donate, feel free to do so. No amount is too small. No amount is too big. We're here to support Sierra Union filmmakers. We're here to support you for this amazing work that you did. Um, and you also want to create, uh, the farm of filmmakers coming out of Sierra Leone, whether it's McKinney or Freetown. Um, but before I do that, we have a question from, uh, somebody that's in the audience, uh, Nova. Ish, can you drop your PayPal link? I've already done mine. So yes. just to reiterate, everybody that is on here, no amount is too small. I'm going to match Ish's $100 today. If you give $5, you give $10, $20, let we talk about change. This is a way that we can change our country. Let's invest in somebody that is doing the work because a lot of us can't go over there and do the work. And so we are an extension um, to helping um, these people. So if you feel like you want to donate, don't feel pressured, um, but give what you can. And we will, like Ish said, we'll be very transparent. We'll show you what the money, the money that's coming in, and we'll make sure that it gets to Tyson. Uh all right, so we'll go ahead and go to Nova. Um, so Nova can ask this question real quick. Go ahead, Nova. Hey, Ish, first of all, your aunt, oh, I got your aunt listening in the background. She said, because she, she watched the um, documentary. I didn't even know I came upstairs to put it on. She's like, boy, I seen it before you. She's like, I ain't got no words for this. And she said, you guys should do a GoFundMe. Second, Tyson, I've, sat, I've watched this documentary for at least a good 15 times for the past five, six days. And my talk here, my, my love for play with tomorrow. You teeny more not me. 
Now, like bone with with fashion, I throw hard for swallow, and I give courage because me don't know how you manage put this together, but I tell you thank you because you make awareness to some part. We 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 nobody lifestyle, but it's like saying that like dirty way they swoop on that rug where nobody no one know. The question me want to ask you is this: What in the NGO them, the United Nations, any human rights organization them? Where they not grown they, where they, where they not salon they do for even the government self and do you feel say the rape culture they play major parts on this? Ma, you can't say that. Okay, Tyson. Tyson, did you hear the question? Might be a little Might disconnect. Be a little yeah. All right, Nova, if it does get disconnected, we'll wait for him to get back on um, and discuss also, that. Um, I know a couple um nonprofits. If we could set up something like a pitch that we could pitch to these nonprofits, I do not mind sending it out after we after it's put together to a couple of companies here in Jersey and a couple of companies around the country that would love to step in and help with situations like this because they look for situations like this to help out with. So if we could put a pitch together, I can put it in some hands. I can't right. make it. And and Sia, what we actually will do, um, instead of uh, you know, dropping our personal uh, you know, PayPal and stuff, we'll we'll create a, a GoFundMe. Um, okay, let's do that this one. There, we'll go ahead and uh, have people get that link directly. It may not be right now because it'll take time to have to type up everything. Um, but today, well, after this is over, by the end of day today, we'll have a GoFundMe page. Um, for Future View Media Center um, and Tyson, and also um, they're also uh, my sister was asking if we can ask Tyson how much IK needs for her business that she is doing. Um, I'm pretty sure she would like to donate to that. I will also match whatever my sister is donating to that. What um, type of business is IK doing? Ish. Um, well, well, uh, Tyson mentioned it earlier. Um, I guess she has like a like a side um, business where she's trying to, you know, whether it's cooking or selling stuff. If she needs um, any type of funds that we can assist with, we're more than happy to do so. Um, but we'll just wait for Tyson to return. Uh, while we're waiting for Tyson to return, I'll go ahead and I'll continue some of the documentary. Um, we will be wrapping up on the next time that he returns. Uh, we don't want to hold everybody up for too long. Um, so let me go ahead and... Uh, yeah, let me go ahead and uh, play the the documentary some more, and then we'll wait for Tyson to come back. When he comes back, we'll be wrapping up. Please hold. As the money dries up, the risk increases. Most see no choice but to carry on. Many have children to provide for and no man around to help. Aisata is a 21-year-old single mother and turned to sex work aged 14. At 16, she became pregnant with her daughter Ramatsu. Her boyfriend left before Ramatsu was born. Right now, there's no hope. I had to go to the family. I was able to put me back in school. I was able to go to the family. But for all the sacrifices, I had to do it for me to go to the why are so many Sierra Leone women like Isata forced to risk their lives to sell sex? To me, this problem, like so much in my country, has its roots in our 11 years civil war in the 90s and early 2000s. It cast a terrible shadow over many lives here, shaping them still. To know the story of so many Sierra Leone sex workers, look no further than Lady P and the day the rebels arrived in her life, aged just 10. Now, top slow text. 
one of my uncles and my granny say, we don't there for three days, we don't get chop. Let me and granny go, then go find chop. We go, then go, then then cow them be me to move. But me have been the up at the panels, that that the outside and they keep the rest. Then like them be my granny, me and see them kill them. They cut this into so the land, so they cut this into. Me and this I don't want so much. Let me go under the women. <laughs> Uh, that is that is a lot. That is heavy. Um, you can't tell me somebody who witnessed their grandmother and their aunt be beheaded doesn't have um, psychological trauma that they they are dealing with. Uh, but before we got disconnected, um, Tyson uh, Nova Nova Soprano had a question, and after that, um, also Sama Sama has a question as well. And anybody who has a question, please send it in the in the message so we can ask um, Tyson. We'll be wrapping this up within the next ten or fifteen minutes. Thank you. The question I wanted to ask is, what are the NGOs, um, the United Nations, and the, the government of Sierra Leone doing to address the situation of sex trafficking? Because we've seen in your documentary, two women were taken from Makeni in the prop, prop, northern provinces, taken to Freetown. From Freetown, they were not, they were taken to Guinea, Senegal, Gambia, and then taken onto Mali without nobody knowing a trace or not even any type of border control to say these girls past here so what are they doing and also do you believe like the rape culture that's going on in Sierra Leone plays a heavy part in the sex work thank you Nova uh, I would like to say they are doing a lot but unfortunately I don't see anything that they are doing um, to, to minimize or control um, the trafficking thing that is happening, you know. Um, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see anything that is happening from the side of the UN, from the side of the um, other NGOs. I don't, I don't want to say they are not doing anything, but I don't see, I don't have, I mean, I've, I've been here and I've been following this story. Like I, I told you, I went to Freetown and do my research and I spent a lot of time there, you know, and so I've, I, I, all I've discovered that these people don't have the protection that they require. That is how, how it is, you know, the, you know, most times when they even have issues and they go to the police, they don't give them the, the attention they, 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 they deserve. And even when they want to do, um, they want to seek for protection from the local or the traditional rulers, um, like the chiefs and the other people, as long as they identify as sex workers, they don't take that. I don't see what's the United Nations is doing. Again, I'm not saying they are not doing anything, but I don't see anything that they do. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that. Um, somebody wants to know, how is Lady P doing? Tyson, were you able to hear the question? We're having a little bit of a lag in the um, connection. Hold on one brief moment. Um, if there's anybody else. LP is there. She was sick. Um, she called me earlier today, but I was also sick. And... Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. So um, you said Lady P was thick. Okay, so I was saying, yeah, she called earlier today to say, um, that I'm sick, but I'm feeling better now. And I was like, okay, but I'm also sick and I can't come to see you now because, you know, she, we've been so close, like families, you know, if they don't see me, they'll call me. And if, if I don't see them, I'll call them to know how they are so reliant on me that anything they have they will call upon me to say this is it 
For example, Ike's mother was, um, there was a fight in the house and the police came in and Ike's mother was taken to the police. And she was also calling me earlier today to say, director, my mother has been taken to the police, can you help? But I mean, I was very sick and I told her, um, I will call someone to see how they can help, but I cannot come now because I'm sick, you know. So that is, um, that is, that is worrying because I've, I've it's not, it's not bad in a way because um, I felt they are too reliant on me that um, even things that are out of their sex business, they will call you to say this is it, you know, which in a way is not a bad thing, but I am just worried that I may not be there for them always. I have to move on. I have to do some stuff, you know, you know but... I told them, um, if I am around, I will always be there for you because you are like families now. I mean, we are, we have this closeness that now be, what they told me is um, you just see them in our office at Future View and they say, what, what happened? And they will say, no, we just come. We don't have anywhere to go. And we feel like when we are close to you, we are, you know, we have that freedom, you know, so that is how much we are close now. Okay, thank you for that. Um, we have another question from Sama. Sama, if you will unmute yourself and ask the question. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Great. Um, yes, once again, I can Tyson, hear you. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the work you've been doing. And I can even understand why they'll do that because, you know, you putting yourself in that position, you're not a person to judge them. And I feel like that's so important for them. Do you know what I'm saying? And again, props to you for what you're doing. Yeah. Um, but just relying yeah. back to the to the, the the issue itself, or let's say the root, you know, you even said in the part of the, the documentary, the civil war had a huge part to play. And you even stated there again today that, you know, the reason why a lot of these people are doing what they're doing, it's not because they want to, but that's an option. <laughs> it's an option that's made to be legal. And... Um, Again, I feel like your role has been so important and prominent to their lives that they can obviously see a bit of hope and hope through what you're doing. Um, but just again, through what you're doing, which is the media part, documentaries and stuff like that. I just heard you talking about your company, how you, you lack support. So the first thing is, I just want to put myself at this, like similar to Ishmael, at the, the, the disposal as well. Um, to say that I'm more than willing to help in any way, shape or form. Um, me self, I get for the salon, hopefully December. And I, um, I'm into media as well. I'm not much of a filmmaker, but I can filmmake as well as photography. So um, I'm putting myself in your disposal to be used and for me to pass my knowledge, any type of help financially, etc. And you mentioned that you even dropped out of school. And a lot of people in your media um, team also dropped out of school. Now, one one thing why they just look, how they look salon from the outside, one thing why they see, nah, the educational um, infrastructure, nah, an option for people that they're going to media, for people that they're going to filmmaking, do you know what I'm saying? Even if it's not available in every school, um, I've been trying to track down are there any government, um, you know, organizations or infrastructures to help younger people to learn to go into the creative sector or the creative industry at all? Um, have you encountered any? And if so, again, how can we help towards that as well? Because I believe salon people, then we are crazy creative. We have a lot to offer to the world. And, you know, that that is... You know, don't don't disqualify yourself. Another thing I want to say as well, in terms of education wise, because you you seem to find you know yourself in a very prominent position, and you're able to make a difference with what you're doing. Then so many more people who have degrees upon degrees, do you know what I'm saying? So well done for that again. But is there any setup organisations um, that we could hopefully help by extending our our talents or skills? Uh. Yes, like you said, um, I, I felt so privileged that I choose um, this creative um, 
um, field because me, like many other Sierra Leoneans, I was dropped out from school for quite a number of years due to the lack of finance and support. And I, I lose my mom and dad in the space of one year in the same, like in the same year. And so I, life has to be difficult for, for me, but I, I decided to, you know, embark on my creative um, um, filmmaking thing. And I, I, I did regret it because um, I felt like, you know, before this film, I've been doing things that have been making so much difference in lives of people. For example, the things that I discussed earlier about disability, about agriculture, about the Ebola and all, of, all these things, you know. Um, I will disappoint you to say that, well, it will disappoint you to know that I am the first film training organization in McKinney. Um, I think in Freetown we have one, the Balantan which is not so functional, um, but apart from that, there is no structures or uh, f maybe from the government or NGO to make sure people that wants to go to this creative field, especially in filmmaking and media business, have the training and the support that they need. You know, like I told you, I've been on, in this field for quite a long time. Um, I've never been supported by the government or an NGO, both locally and internationally. Um, and for example, if, if I want to make a film, um, it has to be, sometimes it has to be from, you know, um, you know, this thing we call contributions, you know, in, in, in Creole, they make contributions among ourselves and which is difficult so earlier i had to be i had to you know move myself to become an okada boy um, riding on motorcycle for transport because that was what i had to do to make sure i live on since i lost my my parents and life was that difficult you know so but i move on from that and i was able to you know, when I was doing this back thing, I was able to bring money into this um, feature view thing because this is something I believe for quite a long time. I just feel like um, I am going through this struggle to make sure other filmmakers, young, the young generation who might want to go into film don't have to go through um, the struggles that I'm going through, you know. So that was why I was doing all those sacrifices, uh, but our government has not been helpful to, to that front. I mean, we have a lot of filmmakers, but especially in the documentary field, um, we, we, we are not, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll be proud to let you know that this is the first documentary film actually that is coming from Sierra Leone that is um, being watched by Sierra Leoneans. Because people in Sierra Leone don't, don't, yes, we are not into the culture of watching documentary films. We just want the films that entertain us, the drama and the fiction films. People don't watch documentaries, you know. Even when I started making documentaries here, you have to force them how move from one community to community and, you know, screen my film for free. No one is paying. And, you know, I have a projector, I am a solar powered kit. And then you force them because it is free. And so they will come around and watch. But people don't watch documentaries, so this is breaking that barrier, and it is something that I hope to build on to make sure and we continue to make these very important things. Because for me, I believe documentaries are more important to society than these fiction films because they will always aim to address a key topic that is burning and that needs an attention, whereas the fiction films will just aim to entertain you, you know. So, but this is, we are neglected in Sierra Leone. If, even if, even among our colleague filmmakers, when they say director of this, this, this film, but when they say a director of who directs a documentary film, people don't see you as an important director in filmmaking. You know, people see the fiction directors as important filmmakers because they will see their films on the streets, they'll buy them and watch them. But documentaries, we don't sell them 
you can't sell them in fact because you don't have anyone to buy them even when you give them free people don't watch them you know but this one is actually breaking that barrier many people in Sierra Leone are watching this documentary so I'm very proud about that achievement yes that is amazing thank you that is nice. I was going to say yeah, thank you very much for that, Tyson. And if there's a way to get hold of your details as well, yeah. because I definitely want to do something, even to bring again more recognition to your your company, because you're doing such an amazing work. It deserves all the attention, and sometimes it might be hard for people to be faced with the reality, but that's the reality, and that's something we need to change. Even now, with the whole sex working thing, we have to now focus on creating more opportunities, job opportunities, etc. So again, well done. Thank you so much. Do really want to tap in with you. I don't know if I could get your details. Maybe if you're not able from CL-ish, um, then we can discuss to definitely have a more better infrastructure for yourself and also for upcoming filmmakers as well. So thank you once again. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Samuel. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, so myself and Sama are um, two of the administrators of the Sierra Leone Club. Um, and once I speak to Sama and I speak to the other admins and some of the members, I know we're gonna we're gonna come to an agreement where we we're, we're gonna donate to to a GoFundMe. We're gonna raise money for you and your company. Um, and also, somebody asked earlier um, the type of business that Ike is doing, and does she need money for her business? Um, if we can get information about that, people are looking to donate to her as well to get her business going and growing. Uh, because, you know, Sierra Leoneans, if we don't if we don't lift each other up, how can we expect the rest of the world to lift us up? And um, like I already said, I pledged $100. Sierra pledged $100. People are already messaging me saying once the GoFundMe goes up, they will be pledging their money and putting their money to this good cause. So, um, Tyson, we I want to thank you. Um, personally for taking this time out you already stated to us you you're not feeling well uh but you took two hours of your time to talk to us uh we're very indebted to you um anything you have my number you have a direct access to me anything that you need that i may be able to assist you with i am more than happy to uh do so um i, I don't want to say i'm a, a a product of my kidney but i was born in my kidney um and my mom took me there and uh, the hotel that you mentioned, uh, Garden State, is actually one of my aunt's hotel. So that's where I stayed at when I was in my kidney. So I was very familiar with it when I saw it. Um, <laughs> so be, being from uh, being born in my kidney, my mom having family from my kidney, <laughs> all of this just it just it just resonated to me. And I actually told my mom about this documentary as well. Um, so I want to say thank you for taking time out to speaking to us. Um, I want to say thank you for putting such amazing body of work together uh, to display to the world. The last time I checked, I believe you were 20, maybe 20,000 views away from 1 million. Um, so that is definitely a feat for you um, because you know, to get a million views on YouTube, it's, you have to have something of great quality. So congratulations to you on everything that you're doing. Anything I can do personally, anything I can be a part of, if you need an extra cameraman in December in Salon, you have my number. Call me. I will be there. I will bring the camera. I will bring my <laughs> cameras. And it's actually 13,000 away from a million now. 13,000 away from a million. So don't worry. We'll get a million by the end of the week. And we, we're here to help. We're here to lend our assistance anywhere we can. Also, um, somebody asked what role did AYV play in promoting films in Sierra Leone? I sent you the message. I think they said oh, yeah. did, AYV, did AYV put this on their platform? Um this 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 documentary. Yeah, they did. Perfect. They did, Perfect. and I was also called, I was also I was also called in their studios for a live interview. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. All right, it, so it, anything it, else? It, Ish, give us ah. some details, please, because um, um, you know our cousin Abdul G works for AYV now as one of their top consultants. Okay. So we, and he's in free time. We can put him in contact so they can get together. All right, no problem. We're definitely going to do that, um, Nova. All right, Sia, anything else? Yeah, I just want to say thank you for taking your time to speak to us and share stories about things that are going on in our country. Um, just like Ish extended his services, I'd like to extend my services as well. I know that it uh, is a long way to recovery, but I would like when I come in December to definitely give some 
trauma recovery support to these ladies if I'm able to. Um, that is the work that I'm doing over in Sierra Leone. So I'd like to extend my support in any way that I can. Um, and if you, I think we'll have you close it out. If you can share any last sentiments that you would like to share with us, your hopes, your goals, your dreams for where you're going next. Um, and that'll close us out for today. Um, well, I think um, I would just like to retreat that um, um, I felt like, you know, no one appreciates this film more than I do because um, it was a challenge for me to make the film because, um, like I said earlier, I had this, you know, from family and friends. And so I was really, you know, skeptical that if I make this film, it won't get the attention that um, it's supposed to. And then people will laugh at me and say, you know, you just waste your time, you know, something like that. You know, so which is why I do appreciate um, you guys more than the way you appreciate the film, because I felt like um, you made you made my dreams become a real. You made me feel like, OK, I've done something that actually is contributing towards um, the development of my country. Because, um, I mean, if we have to develop as a country, we cannot leave some section of the people in the society out of the development, you know, we all have to develop together for the country to develop, you know. So I, I mean, I, I want to say thank you guys. And I also want to say, um, I'm so proud. I'm happy that um, um, I've met a family. You guys are families. You guys are from Sierra Leone. And of course you are families. Um, yeah, and that's, um, well, what am I going to say? I'll just say thank you guys for putting this together. Thank you for, you know, creating the awareness. And I, I hope we will continue to, to let people um, know more about this topic and then see how together we can make the lives of these women better. And also to see how we can help improve the filmmaking business in Sierra Leone. Because um, I'll, I'll be proud to see Everybody that's work in this in the film, from myself as a director, the camera, sound, whosoever that was in the crew, was someone who was trained by feature view. You know, these are people that I I I bring up, I train them, and then they walk into this film, and I'm so happy that um, they can actually you know put themselves into competition, and that and that we can we can together we can build um, a better Sierra Leone. So I am very happy for my Sierra Leonean brothers and sisters. I didn't know this exists. I was, uh, I was in the US um, in 2019. Um, I was at San Francisco, um, you know, but I, I spent maybe two months, but I never knew uh, this kind of family exists out there. So I was totally lost. And so I'm really surprised that you guys are all together in this form. And I want to say thank you for that. And that um, I'm so proud. Um, one thing we, we, we normally have in Sierra Leone is we know like we serve. That is one, one, one common statement we have in Sierra Leone, that Sierra Leoneans we know like we serve, you know. Um, but I mean, seeing you guys, you know, living and doing things together as you are, I felt like really that is not the case, you know, so thank you. And I hope we can continue discussing. And um, whenever you have, you, you want another, you know, another talk like this, wow. if I'm well, I'll be available. That's totally. I'm very sick and, you know, I'm, so, I'm sweating since the start, but, I felt like this is very important. And so I had to, you know, be here. Um, so thank you guys. And I'm also now thinking of um, what to do next because it's very important. Um, but I think for now, I am just going to concentrate on, you know, you know, broadening this film and then making it into the 90 minutes where I can bring more stories in. And then along the line, I'll be thinking of 
what is going to be the next topic because I always want to make my my themes to address a certain topic that needs to address. So that is the, that is what I'm. So thank you guys. I'm so honored. I felt like um, you know I felt like I'm from. I mean, above the moon, you know, I feel like I'm above the moon to, you know, to meet all of you guys. I know there's a lot of people that are listening and that do not have the opportunity to talk to me directly. I want to say thank you for spending the time and I hope I can answer all your questions. If um, you send it directly on my staff, I'll be able to answer those that I have not answered. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a couple people on there uh, that are sending messages to you. We appreciate you so much, Tyson. Thank you so much. May God bless you. Thank you for creating this. Uh, my dad said to give his regards to you on a job well done. Thank you, Mr. Conte. May God continue to enable you, continue the work. Sileon is blessed to have you But from Esther. Uh, Bashir said, thank you for everything you are doing, Mr. Tyson. May Allah continue to bless you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Everybody's saying thank you. Um, we're definitely appreciative. We're indebted to you for this uh, work that you did. And um, yeah, we, I don't want to hold you any uh, much longer. The conversation is actually con going to continue uh, for the rest of us that are on Clubhouse. Yeah. We are having an after show where we're going to discuss our steps, our personal steps of what we're going to do next about, you know, bringing more awareness and also helping Tyson. So uh, that room on Clubhouse is at 3.30. Um, which is 8.30, um, you know, UK time or Salon time. Um, so everybody that's, you know, at home that is on Clubhouse, feel free to join us um, and we're going to have this conversation in the next 13 minutes. Tyson, thank you. Thank you to your family. Thank you, Tyson. Everybody. We're blessed to have you. We, I pray that you get well really soon. I will be keeping in touch. Um, and, you know, that's it. That's it for me. I'm, I'm, thank I'm you, done. everyone, for showing up. We appreciate you. Hi, Moody. <laughs> thank you, Tyson. <laughs> y'all can take off your mics and say thank you. Yeah, y'all can take your mics and Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Tyson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tyson. All right, guys. And please don't forget to um, get back to me about IK, okay? Um, I I'll get the information for you right here. All right. Thank you. Thank oh. you, Tyson. And we wish you a speedy recovery, okay? Yeah. yeah, yes, indeed. Is that my favorite cousin, Reiki? Yes. Man, Nova, Nova come on out your phone, man. <laughs> yeah, He's been on his phone this whole Nova, Nova has been on his phone this whole time. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Tyson. Yes, sir. Mr. Tyson, may God continue for bless you, sir. Yeah, man. <laughs> Tyson, if anything, they way we can help you with JR Big, no afraid for reach out. Yeah, Let's we do. We do our live, live one. Yeah. Mm. All right, y'all, I'm about to end this Zoom room. Um, we yeah, will head yeah, over yeah, into yeah, the yeah. after discussion. After show on Clubhouse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank y'all so much for doing yeah. this, man. Like, for real. No yeah. problem. This is for our people, man. It's for our people. I ain't going to lie. You guys are amazing. Yeah, you guys just let me know uh, how I can contribute, yeah? Oh, yeah, we're creating a GoFundMe today, and we'll have it launched today. So everybody can Awesome, awesome. We need a proposal so we can put it in front of a lot of companies that could be able to help back oh, home. Cece, oh, no. your baby's so cute. Hello, 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 hello baby. Hello, hey, baby. baby. Hey, beautiful. Oh. <laughs> She's so cute. And look at them She's cheeks. Not She's not interested in nothing else. Got, like <laughs> all right, so all right, so we're gonna end this room now. So um if you would like to continue the conversation, please meet awesome. us on Clubhouse. All right. You guys have a great rest. Moody, Moody, get yeah, you cats come on. Y'all showed up, y'all showed up though. Y'all showed up today. Bye. Bye bye. bye.